Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 93. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today is Amber. Hi, everyone. And we're just going to chill and talk about some of the games we've been playing. This will be Chillcast number four. I already forgot the subtitle. Mark. Well, well, you came up with it. What was it? Chill again. Chill again. Yes. I had to look back and see what the other chill casts were called. Uh, we had Chillcast 2, the Chillcastening, and then the last one was Revenge of Chill. Something like that. And now we have Chill again. And yeah, it's a chill cast. We're just going to hang out. This is what we call the podcast when there's not really an agenda. Not a topic. We didn't discuss it there's in no advance. There's no special guest. It's mm-hmm. just us. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's really, we're just being lazy. <laughs> oh, Mark in the chat says every cast is a chill cast in the winter. Wow, Mark. That's a, it's a fair point. Way to remind us that it's winter time. Yeah, it nice. is really nice and cozy <laughs> here in the basement. <laughs> uh, but I believe today was our last non frigid day for I was, a while. I was having a moment imagining it was fall or even summer again. I mean, technically it is still autumn. Right? Until like mid-December? Or is it like next week? Well, the solstice is later in December, but that doesn't really matter because the seasons usually go around it. Right, but I I feel like, you know, February is the coldest month, usually, right? Yeah, January, February. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, we've got a ways till it's actually cold. Anyways, (laughs) that's it for the weather. (laughs) Oh, gosh. I was not prepared for a podcast. I forgot the the timing. It's hard. Yeah, you know how it is. It's hard to find people. It's hard to find topics. I, I lose track of time. Time doesn't mean anything anymore, uh, which usually is a good thing. But for podcast scheduling, it's not. Let's talk about something warm and sunny, and that's the ocean. Oh, Mark has a new name. This is good. A new chill, the chill strikes back. Yeah. <laughs> I got to write these down for next time. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> but the ocean, you didn't, no one heard my transition. Well, uh, I heard something about oceans, but I was thinking about winter, and you do not think about the ocean in the wintertime. That's why I was transitioning. It was a contrasted <laughs> transition mm-hmm. into something warm and sunny, which is the ocean. Although the ocean is often cold. So... There's that. But near the ocean is often not. It, you know, the parts of the ocean you typically visit. I guess the ocean's just as cold as land, you know, if you were to aggregate the earth. If you were to cover yourself in earth. <laughs> you know, there's hmm. cold parts of the ocean. There's cold. I mean, I guess the, the ice cap, is that count as ocean? If it's just all like Antarctica? How much like dirt is there and how much of it is just ice? I think there's very little dirt. Like, how big does a glacier or or an iceberg, I guess, have to be before it's an island? Mark, you're taking this too far. I don't think it counts as an island. I'm just wondering if the ocean is warmer or colder than the land. I'm sure someone has researched this. You could probably Google it. No one knows. Mm. Science has no answer. Anyways, (laughs) uh, (laughs) there's a game called Oceans. We've been playing it. It's very fun. Yes, very fun. We it does it have a warm tropical vibe to it. So it's the third game, I believe, in the Evolution series of games from North Star. And the designers, I don't remember their names. I'm sorry, designers. Chillcast. Yeah, it's Chillcast. I guess I, I can't apologize. Everyone knows the. it's very low effort here. Anyways, there was Evolution, then there was Evolution Climate, which was a sequel, but not really a sequel, because it was kind of just the basic Evolution game plus an expansion built in, but they sold it as a sequel? I forget. Uh, And now there's Oceans, which is more different than Evolution was to Evolution Climate, I believe. But I don't remember much about Climate. So I've only played the original Evolution as a demo with their digital version at PAX East. And it seemed fine. And I actually own it. I think I got a code there. And I own the game because I was going through all my video games earlier and making a spreadsheet. Because that's what I do when I'm bored. And it was listed there. But I've never installed it or played it. 
Anyways, we also have Evolution Climate, or Matt does, but it lives here. And I haven't played that in probably five years. And I recall thinking it was okay. But now we got Oceans, and it's about the oceans. And I'm having a lot of fun with it. It's a little tableau builder game where you're trying to build up different species of fish or aquatic animals and then keeping them alive. You played it, what, once? Yeah, only once, but I do want to play it again. It was really cool. I liked that there was lots of player interaction when you were building your tableaus. Yeah, uh, because anytime you feed... So how it works is that you're making these fish species and the cards that you have for your tableau are traits for that species. So you play a trait card, and if it's the first one you played, you bring in a little fish holder thing, food holder, and then you have that species that has that trait. And then you can add more traits to it to give it more powers. And so the the name of the game, which reminds me a little bit of Martin Wallace's London 2nd Edition, is that you're trying to create as many species as possible that you can keep alive, which is difficult past, like, two. You can pretty consistently keep two alive. Getting past that is a bit trickier, and that's where the game gets fun. Because every turn, you can only feed with one of your species. So only one of your species can actively acquire food, or, like, not, I guess, acquire food, or or eat food. Mm Mm-hmm. And then you kind of fill up their stomachs with food, and then that food needs to linger around for them to keep harvesting points, because then you transfer that food to your own scoring pile each round from all of your species, and that's how you score. But if you ever run out and you can't score from a given species, it just dies off. So you're trying to stockpile food in each of these species and have them hold on to it, So you can keep bleeding out points, which sort of makes sense, (laughs) you know, from a thematic point. And so you're trying to go as wide as possible. Uh, The tricky part is that unless you deliberately give a, a, a species a trait that doesn't allow them to hunt, you can always eat from an opponent's stockpile. There's, de- there's defense and blocking and that kind of stuff, uh, but there's always the risk that an opponent's just going to bleed you dry. And then if you have more than one fish species dry that's empty of food, only one of them can feed on your turn, so you're probably going to lose one of them. Uh, but there are powers that give you, like, passive feeding, so certain ones can leech off of other ones and have, like, symbiotic relationships, which is cool. So it's got all kinds of fun cards. Uh, how it works is, like, the, the main game, there's, like, 12 different types of cards. And you're only supposed to play with those 12, but then there's this other secondary deck that's all unique cards, and they're much more powerful, but they cost points. And they come in, in like, the second half of the game, uh, and that's when the game gets, like, real intense. I can see why you might want to not play with that second deck to make a more pure game, but I don't think it would... Maybe it feels shorter. I guess it does play out a bit shorter if you do that, but I feel like it would drag a bit if you if you didn't have that second deck. Yeah, but I liked it. I think it was more, it was more wild than Evolution. I feel like the original Evolution was kind of only that first half of this game. It was only the like the cards you knew of, and it was crunchy in the sense that you kind of knew all the cards people had access to. There were no surprises, but you you then kind of just fell into predictability. Uh, although Evolution had this kind of tragedy of the commons things thing that the Oceans one sort of has, but I don't recall it being quite as severe. Uh, or I, I recall Evolution the base the original game being more severe in the tragedy of the commons dynamic. I don't know. What do you think? For Oceans, I I just liked, like I said before, the player interactions. So I liked that you could adapt your species and they were constantly adapting according to what the players around you were doing. Um, so all the traits were good. You always wanted all of the traits on your species, but you were limited to three or four in some cases. And the first half of the game, I built up a really self-sustaining, beautiful... A few species that were interacting together in their little environment and then mark comes along at the very end of the game and has this mega predator that just eats everything from my bountiful system 
and that was annoying. But it was also fun. Um, I liked the un- unpredictability of the monsters at the end in that secondary deck. It, there definitely is that element that everything you created is eventually destroyed. But I think that works with the theme of the game. Everything is changing and evolving constantly um, according to what all the other species in the environment are doing. Yeah, it is very much like natural selection in fast forward. Like as soon as you play a species, there's a possibility that like by the time your next turn comes around, they'll die. Like they'll completely yeah. die out. So you have to constantly be adapting to the board state and also, if you want to be good, adapting to what you think the board state will look like two to three rounds from now. Mm-hmm. And that's the real key of the game is this kind of future prediction back and forth where you're trying to out-predict the other players, which which is a really cool aspect. I, I like that quite a bit yeah. with Oceans. It's, Production's really good, too. Uh, North Star, does a, that is the name of the it's beautiful. publisher, right? It, it is a beautiful game. I really liked... I don't know. This is my kind of game, I think. It's it's almost the opposite of a Euro game where you're building a machine that is self-sustaining. This is the kind of game that al- inter- introduces... Maybe you would call it randomness, but I just like that you're constantly adapting and changing and shifting strategy. I, I well, really it is like an that. engine building game. Like you it are is, building but engines, but you're constantly fighting. You're you're constantly building and losing these little tiny engines as people attack each other. Yeah, so it's not one of those games that whoever conceived of the best strategy at the beginning will win. It's not one of those games where the people who've played it constantly have an advantage over new players necessarily there's always some of that i think it evens the playing field for everyone in a way i like it yeah 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 no i'll keep i'll hang on to this um one for sure and like i said the production by north star which i double checked and is the name of the publishing company is very nice uh it's got a kind of built-in insert thing going on uh, the only thing i wish is that like you have these little tiny fish tokens like hundreds of them and they're brightly, you know, brightly colored fish, but all of the places you put them in are like part of the this insert, like cardboard insert system that's like coral themed and brightly colored. And they literally get lost, like just like in real life, like the fish camouflage in the coral. But that's inconvenient <laughs> for a board game where you need to know how many tokens are in the box. It's not good to have those tokens literally camouflage into the box. Uh, that's my one little gripe on an otherwise uh, very attractive production. I don't know. I thought it was fun when certain players thought that we were out of fish. And then I grabbed the fish that were hiding and they didn't know about them. Well, it's just fun. That's that's very <laughs> much a you thing. That, that uh, drives me nuts. I wasn't hiding them. <laughs> no, they were literally hiding themselves. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's Oceans. I'll have a review of it out in some point, but I do want to get a few more plays of it in. I, I'm not 100% settled. I think it'll get a solid score from me, but I don't know. I may run bored with it. We'll see. I liked it more than we'll you, We'll see how I it think. goes. I really liked it. Cool. Well, that's always a, a solid. That means I'll get to play it. <laughs> Let's move on to board games, the board game, the card game, which I believe we podcasted about. Have you and I podcasted about it before? No. I think I podcasted about it with Ben. Oh, what ben, do you th- ben wasn't a fan. What do you think of it? It's fine. Like, I I like it as this meta thing. I think it's great for playing with your inside group of board game people. It was also fun to introduce to my my people who know that we play a lot of board games and kind of are familiar, but aren't gamers because they laughed at the meta of it too um and they also thought it was fun because it's not a hard game to pick up it's just kind of funny um so it can be good in certain audiences it's just not a very fun game yeah i'm with you it's kind of okay i wish there was some way to cycle more of the like special power cards in and out like i wish that was more of a factor because the problem is it's very, very difficult to actually get a high score. You're going, like, you want to be able to achieve, like, a royal flush. And as it is, you're not, you're almost certainly not going to be able to do that. I don't think I've seen... I did it once. A royal flush? I'm pretty sure I did. Oh, no, wait, no. Royal flush isn't in the game. You did a straight flush, though? Yeah, straight flush. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. 
It's possible, but it depends very much on the cards you draw about. But then you have to like necessarily out. sacrifice the other ones, and so it's probably not worth it because it's really about trying to get high. You you're really shooting for like medium level poker hands across all three columns, ideally. Mm-hmm. And the problem is that, like, it doesn't quite fit well with the way that poker works, right? right. So, on one hand, like, like last time I played, I, th- I was going to try to go for four of a kinds on both the top and the middle rows. And then try to do something cool on the bottom. But I figure four of a kind, I can probably and try to get it. And I had a, I had a, three of my five uh, special power cards let me adjust up or down a number. So I figured, okay, yep. four of a kind is the one to go for. But the problem is I got the four of a kind on the top, but I couldn't quite squeeze it on the middle. And then I got three of a kind. But the problem is that's like the second to lowest one. Right. So now I've just hosed myself because I can't get anything better than that on a bottom. And so I just ended up being okay again. Which is the same, I don't know, it, it, it ends up, I, I never feel like I, I've, I accomplished anything in that game. It's like I did okay or I completely fail. Yeah, the, the scoring is not fun. The gameplay is not very fun. The cards are fun. They're a lot of fun. Yeah, the deck of cards itself is the mm-hmm. most fun part of the game, not mm-hmm. necessarily the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just wish there was a bit more. I wish there was a little bit more to that one. Maybe they'll tweak it before it comes out. I'm curious to see what mm-hmm. they're doing. Uh, Naylor Games just announced that they hired like a media manager. Like he's really, he's really pushing this publishing company thing forward, and and that's really exciting to see. Because you know, if you listen to the podcast, you heard him a few weeks ago, a couple episodes ago. Uh, he's a super nice guy. I still love Magnate. I think that's a great game, and and actually the production of that just came, just got shipped to shipped to people. A few weeks ago, I got my copy. I got to open it still. I think I'm going to record an unboxing, which is why I haven't opened it yet. Didn't we open it and play it? No. Did we, we not? Really? No, it's sitting up on the shelf over there. Oh. I opened the expansion because I wanted to see what the expansion stuff was. Oh, okay. But it's just sitting on top of the box now because I haven't opened the box yet. Well, my first playthrough of that one was very memorable. I keep thinking about it. So maybe that's why I thought we played... Our first playthrough was back in California, right? Yeah. I had that that you know, pr- that pre-production copy in a shoebox, I think. Yeah, and Ellie was sitting on my lap, oh, yeah. moving the pieces all around the table. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So, yeah, I think this game will be okay. I'm not super excited about it. I'm curious to see if there's something more fun that can be done with this deck of cards. A very very funny uh, yeah. card, like meta board gamey cards. That's fun. Uh, but the game itself, I would I would work on a bit more. I think it's fine, it, it, but it's nothing special. Next, we've been playing The City. Not My City, although My City is very good, but we finished My City. We've gone back to The City. I get them mixed up all the time. Which is a little card game from Tom Lehman, who did Race for the Galaxy. And I've, I guess I should go back and try Race for the Galaxy. We like Roll for the Galaxy quite a bit. Mm-hmm. But I played Race for the Galaxy like before I was into board games and was completely confused the entire time, hmm. uh, as many people are. But the city is like that kind of system of you're building out a tableau and you're paying like cards are the currency, but also what you're playing in the simplest form possible. It's as simple as can be. But it, the good thing is it only takes like 10 minutes to play once you know what you're doing. You just play it real quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then if your strategy doesn't pan out, you just try again. So it's casual in that sense of like you just try to try something and maybe the luck of the draw lets you do that. Maybe it doesn't. But it's just very pleasant to play. And, and we pull that one out when we need you know something short uh, to play if we're waiting for someone or if we just want to play something short. We've been playing it lately. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like it. It's very chill. It like is this chill. chill cast. It's a chill like it's a chill cast kind of game. Yeah, and honestly, I shouldn't like it as much as I do. It yeah, is I was very surprised. random. I was surprised you liked it as much, but all of our group likes it. I think, but it's it it is the demonstration of the principle that. You can get away with way more randomness if your game is short. 
And because this game takes 10 to 15 minutes to play for like a strategy game, I mean, you're trying to build an engine and accomplish things. But because it's so short, it gets away with so much randomness. Yeah, I agree with that. People don't like randomness. Because we don't play it. We never play it just once. We'll play like three or four times in a row or until, you know, the person shows up or dinner's arrived or something. And then, you know, everyone has a chance to execute the strategy really well. Yeah. People don't like randomness when it interferes with plans they've been developing for hours. Yeah. The only game that really gets away with that is like Twilight Imperium. But even then, there's lots to mitigate the randomness. There it's not is. super there is. severe. And, mm-hmm. it, and it feels dramatic. You know, it feels mm-hmm. within the theme. But I mean, generally, you know, the longer the game is, the less random you want it to be for sure. Yeah. That's why Munchkin's awful. <laughs> Right, if Munchkin was a twenty-minute game, it'd be way better, but it's not. It's like a ninety-minute game, or longer if you get really log jammed. I've never actually played Munchkin. I've seen many groups of people play it, but I've never played it. Oh, you? It's not good. <laughs> it's uh, what's it like? I've seen people play it. It looked very boring. I don't even know what to compare it to. It's like if Uno had counter spells. Sure. Okay. Like, like an Uno kind of does because it has the draw cards, mm-hmm. but you can only play those on your turn. Mm-hmm. So just imagine if Uno draw cards could be played at instant speed. That's Munchkin. Okay. So anytime anyone gets down to Uno, everyone's like, well, I'm playing the draw two on you. And then you do that till everyone runs out of draw cards. And then whoever happens to be the person whose turn it is when it, once everyone runs out of draw cards wins. But it's like 90 minutes into the game. Okay. Yeah, that's what Munchkin's like. Yeah. Anyways, the city. Check it out. It's. I don't think many people know about it. I mean, Race for the Galaxy is probably better, but the city takes ten minutes. All right. Speaking of games, we talked about and played and reviewed. No, I haven't reviewed this one. I should review this one. Mm-hmm. But I, I'm sure I, we we certainly talked about it when we first played it at PAX a few years ago. Uh, that's Pulsar twenty eight forty nine, a game I absolutely adore. Actually, the theme of this podcast might be games that you haven't heard of that maybe you should play. I don't think Ocean's got a ton of hype. I feel like, I don't know. I don't know what the reach on Ocean's was. But yeah, Evolution got a decent amount. I don't know if if Ocean's got it. Uh, But The City, I don't think has any hype. Pulsar is a brilliant game. I love it. It's so much fun. And I don't think anyone talks about it anymore. It's by Suchi, Alexander Vladimir, no, Vladimir, Vladimir Suchi, uh, published by CGE. It is a point salad game through and through, but it's spacey and fun and you get to just poke around and do fun stuff. It's very much a, here's six different little mini strategy game, like little mini strategic paths, pick four of them, try to do well in three to four of them. Kind of like a, kind of like Trajan in that way. You haven't played Trajan. But in that way, where everything kind of gets you points, but certain things are going to be slightly better that time. And then you got to figure out how to execute those strategies as efficiently as possible. And I can totally see if you don't like that style of game. A lot of people don't. But for that style of game, the style that I happen to like, it's one of the best for sure. It also has the best dice drafting mechanism of I, I've ever played. Can you think of a better dice drafting mechanism? Not a better one. I just didn't think it was like particularly good. I don't know. <laughs> it's so good. It's brilliant. Okay, if you haven't if you didn't hear our episode or you haven't played Pulsar, here's how it works. You roll all the dice, uh, which is going to be number of players times two plus one. Two and plus one. Number of dice. And then you take the dice values and you sort them by dice value. You find the median die, and then you figure out on which side of the median has... Anyways, you. I'm not going to f- explain it all, because it, it makes sense once you do it, but it's very difficult to explain. There's like a whole page of the rule book for this, but once you learn it, it's the simplest thing possible. Anyways, you put a little marker near the median, and then when you draft a die, depending on if it's above or below that marker... You move your little token up or down for either passive income of a handy resource, 
uh, these white cubes, or you move up and down the initiative track. So the better dice that you draft, the worse you get the, at those two things. And the worse dice that you draft, the better you get at those things. So it just creates this really, really fun, interesting decision space in the process of just drafting two dice, uh, which which is really, really nice. It's kind of like the the turn order auction mechanism in five tribes. It's like the thing that sets you up to play the game, but it's also like the best part of the game. You don't, I don't think, did you ever play five tribes? Yeah, many times. Really? Okay. Mm-hmm. We haven't played that in years. Yeah. Uh, it's really, really good. I'm trying to think, uh, Coinbra also has a very good dice drafting mechanism. In fact, that might be the closest parallel of Pulsar. It's also kind of point salad It's got a bunch of different systems. It also has a pretty good dice drafting mechanism. I remember also Dice, what's the RPG-ish one? The uh, Dice, it's not Dice Throne, that's the that's the combat one. What's it called? Role Player, that's what it's called. Role Player also has a good dice drafting. But Pulsar beats them all. And you get to do all kinds of stuff. You can build up space stations, construct them. They give you cool passive incomes and bonus stuff. You can fly around the map, explore worlds get random stuff from those worlds you can explore technologies you can do your own little private board track evolution thing you know it's just everything you can do is fun right it's a point salad game yes but the key to a point salad game is that every bit of the salad needs to be delicious just like real life and it is in pulsar like one bad component to a salad you really throw it off. Yes. You get that one type of green that's like far too bitter for the rest of the salad. Screws the whole thing up. I guess the point salad metaphor works really nicely then. It does. Yeah. People use it as a pejorative, but I, I like point salad games. It's a pejorative? Oh, yeah. Really? No, that's the whole point is that the idea that people say it's a point salad because, you know, I don't know. Actually, I don't. I guess because there's just a bunch of different random stuff thrown together like you would throw together a salad. Mm -hmm. And the idea, people use it pejoratively if they're like, well, it doesn't matter what you do because everything gives you points. Well, it still matters what you do because you have to get the most points. I mean, bad ones, yeah. (laughs) Bad ones, it doesn't matter. Okay. It it cannot really matter, or at least not feel like it matters, which is really the most important thing. Like Carpe Diem's fun, but it's getting to the point now even after four or five plays, where I think it still matters what you do once you reach a certain competency. Hmm. But, I don't know, Ben and I tied, and then we had a one-point scoring differential in back-to-back games, and I started getting suspicious. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, But Pulsar, I mean, man, Pulsar and Castles of Burgundy, those are my two favorite point salads for sure. Well-constructed salads. Mm Mm-hmm. What's your favorite part of Pulsar? Your favorite mini game, other than the dice drafting, which is clearly the best part. I like the 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 what are they called the gyro something gyro dines gy- gyro dines gyro dines. Yes, that was the most fun. Is it gyro? No, I gyro. It'd be gyro because they're spinning <laughs> like a gyroscope, right? <laughs> Probably. I don't yeah, know. you spin up the gyro dines. That was the most fun. Definitely, they, they harness the power of stars. Yes. See, that's my least favorite part, although they're very lucrative, like point lucrative. Yeah, that was the best part of the game. I like the space stations. Oh, you I didn't squeeze play them those together. At all. Yeah, they're often often easy to ignore, but you squeeze them together, you get income sometimes, you can build up really fun stuff there. They looked fun, but they didn't work for my strategy at all, so I ignored them completely. Well, that was smart, because there were no bonuses given on them. Right. So. Uh, when there are bonuses given on them, you, you got to go for them because they can be quite good. Yeah. I won. It was fun. Yeah. Because I won. It's just a fun game. Like, I don't like using the adjective fun, but man, Pulsar is fun. It's a table hog, though. Yes. It takes up a ton of table space. But it does so in uh, with a round board, which is just great. Mm-hmm. I did enjoy it. Impractical, the board. but looks amazing. Mm-hmm. Anyways, Pulsar 2849. The next game that I just posted a review of actually takes place, I believe, in the lore in the year 3000. I didn't 
play this game. How did it make it on our list? I don't think we talked Dinosauria, about this. Because I just, uh, I don't know. I just wanted to mention. I reviewed it recently. It's the last review I did. Chillcast. Yeah. It, it was It was fine. It was fine. Is that what your it, review said? It was fine. <laughs> I gave it a five out of ten. <laughs> okay. Uh, which is a fine score. It was fine. It was a lot like Splendor. I don't really like Splendor, so. Splendor's great. What? You like Splendor? Yes. I've always liked Splendor. I guess I shouldn't be surprised. Everyone likes Splendor, but me. You actually don't like it? No, not really. I thought you said it was fine. Like, Yeah, it's fine. I think I also gave it like a five. Oh, okay. Okay. I mean, it's not bad. I think maybe two-player Splendor works nicely. I think that's what I wrote in my review. But I, I, it got added to Board Game Arena a little while ago, and I tried it online, and I'm like, yeah, this is this is dull. Interesting. It's, it's uh, what's happening? Like, there's nothing, there's nothing to it. It's just like. It's a chill game. But it's not. Like, it takes way longer than it should. It should, it, it should be like the city. It should be a 15 minute game, but it's like a 45 minute game. That's the problem. I feel like it goes over really well with new gamers, though. Yeah, I'm not denying that everyone else loves it. Okay. And for a while there, it was like the you know, game of that length and complexity, like intro game, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, never excited me. I don't know why people got excited for it. Look, Mark agrees with me in the chat. Splendor's mediocre also. Oh. Well, maybe I liked it because I always won. That helps. That's true. I am bad at Splendor. You're very bad at Splendor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I don't know, it's just too abstracted. It's like, it's... If you abstract something, it should become strategically more rich. Like that's what Knizia does so well, right? He'll make very abstracted, simple games, but they come become strategically rich. The problem is that Splendor just loses all flavor, and then it's just flavorless. Like it doesn't add anything else. Mm-hmm. Okay, let me let me work this metaphor, right? Okay. So, okay. So if a game has lots of like fun, exciting stuff, it's spicy. Yeah, that's what it is. Right? It's like when people don't want something spicy, but then they forget to add salt. Right? They take away all the fun spices. And it's like, well, you still got to salt your your food to make it taste good. And so when you abstract something out so far, like the idea of engine building, so far into like the most basic components possible, you got to make sure it's really nicely salted with deep, deep strategy. I'm on fire with the metaphors. Mm. You don't you don't think that that was a great metaphor, Mark? <laughs> I don't like metaphors. I'm not even hungry. They're all about food, but <laughs> you know I don't like metaphors. <laughs> like well, as I a concept, like, I, I don't like metaphors. <laughs> that's right. You hate them even more than me. I just tell my debate students to not use them because they take up too much time for little value. I but guess they're always bad. <laughs> Also, debate students are notoriously bad at coming up with decent metaphors. Ooh, Mark asks, can we rate games on a chill scale? What is the most chill game? Carcassonne. It's hard to argue with that. That is hard to argue with. My first instinct was to say catch the moon, but that has the inherent tension of, like, will it fall over or will it not? You have to actually, like, physically move the pieces, too, which is tension. No, there's tension built into that. Carcassonne is is really chill yeah because it's pastoral and it's like strategically chill although you can get really intense with carcassonne if you memorize all the tiles oh well i haven't done that what else is chill well you can go most chill to least chill least chill is maybe something like stay cool um well okay yes stay cool (laughs) i was thinking of um why am i space alert Oh, yeah. Yeah. Space Stressful real time game has got to be the least chill. Yeah. Space alert. Yeah. Or just something really grindy like um, like Here I Stand. That would not be chill. Mm-hmm. You can't really chill with that game. Least chill. We've got really sad games, sad, serious games like this Guilty Land. That's not chill at all. What is chill? What's more chill than Carcassonne? I'm telling you, it's the most that chill. That might be it. You might have have the answer. Mm-hmm. And this like, is this is chill games that are still good games, right? Like Go, you could say is like serene, but it's but like it's underneath. Chill. It's like the yeah. duck, right? It's on top. It looks chill, but underneath, it's it's furiously paddling. I'm looking at the small box games. 
small games usually aren't that chill. Yeah, they got to be conflicty. The mm-hmm. problem is the the shelf that's right in front of me when I'm podcasting is the GMT game shelves. That is not chill. And there aren't really any <laughs> chill games in there. Yeah. Uh, well, that Tetris game was kind of chill. The one I can't pronounce, Arial. That was the most horrible accent to pronounce that word ever. <laughs> Newsfjord's kind of chill. Yeah. Seikatsu. Seikatsu. Oh, Very chill. Oh, yeah. That would count. Ooh, that one might be Carcassonne. Mm, it's no. got the little birds. I still vote Carcassonne. No, Seikatsu's more chill. I feel more tense playing Seikatsu. You can't, you can't be cutthroat in that game. You still feel some tension, though. Roland Wrights can be pretty chill. What, like Yahtzee? <laughs> Yahtzee's annoying because it has such big big swings. The only other, I don't have many rolling rights. I was looking at Castles of Burgundy, the dice game. Above and Below is pretty chill for like a heavier game. It is, yeah. Yeah, that's got some chill stuff going on. Trick takers are chill. This is true. Mm-hmm. I mean, we often don't make them chill. I'd say they're a 9 out of 10 on the chillometer. They can be chill as long as we aren't partners on the trick taking. Yeah, you and I mm-hmm. partnering on trick taking doesn't work. Nope. And I don't know why. I would say my city was chill, but I also raged heavily. <laughs> you did. <laughs> at that game. <laughs> it made me very mad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that about covers it. There are some chill games. We should make a chillometer rating. We should, and we should have another chill cast with one of these names. Yeah, and it's just all chillometer stuff. We could have it on the shortest day in the winter and literally call it every cast is a chill cast in the winter. We should have Mark join us since he created the name. There we go. Mm -hmm. I like it. What is the shortest? Is that the solstice December 21st? Look it up. I don't know when it is. We got to have our chill facts ready to go, I guess, when we're doing chill casts. A chill cast chill fact. Winter solstice. Yeah, December 21st. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Sunset time. Boston. Uh, December 21st. Yikes. Sun will be down at 415. That's a bad day. What's the sunrise time? 710. It's a bad, bad day. So that's nine hours and five minutes of sun. Not that's enough. That's awful. Not enough. Yeah, we better spice that day up. That's just sad. <laughs> Why do we have to live so far north? I didn't really realize that we did. We do. Until we moved here and the winters were bad. <laughs> How do Canadians do it? I don't know. Canadians, write us. How do you do it? <laughs> Or Icelandic people. Oh, you know or from what? Greenland. What else is high? In, I I never know how far north like the British Isles are longitudinally, or is it longitude longitudinally, or would it be no, lati- latitude. latitudinally? No, my Canadian friend is going to be in town on the twenty first, so maybe we should have her over and ask her how. Oh, the she's Canadians coming down for do warmer it. weathers, huh? warmer weather no she lives in san diego right now you think she's coming here for warmer weather is the uk all further north is this a is google maps i don't think that's correct the map that you have i'm pretty sure google maps is mercator so it would be correct oh wow how is like all of europe further north than us well how is this correct? You We're, do see lots of pictures of cold and misery when looking Boston at Europe. Boston is as far north as like Madrid? That doesn't make any sense. Hold on. Boston, what do, what's what's the term I got to look up here? Latitude. Latitude. 42 degrees north. Uh, I saw Madrid. 40 degrees. What's, what's London? 51 degrees north. But we get colder than London. Well, they're an island surrounded by a bunch of ocean. Yeah, I think that- the ocean moderates. Yeah. I mean, we're only like 10 miles from the ocean right now. Why doesn't our ocean moderate? I don't know. Maybe they have warmer currents. Who, Who knows? Kn- Who knows what's going on? <laughs> yeah, um, Europe's got it. 
how did I not realize this? Like, yeah. Okay. Weird. We're like northern Spain. Why We're like middle of Italy. have all kind of white on it? What is what? What's all the white? Desert. Interesting. Desert. Hmm. Yeah. That's the Sahara Desert. I didn't know it extended all the way up, though, into Asia. Yeah. That's huh. Iran. That's deserty. Kazakhstan. Yeah. Then you got uh, some mountains there. Th- this has this... gone way off the rails. <laughs> okay. You had to have pulled up a map for this part of the podcast, yeah. or it's not going to make any sense. You probably have to cut this part out. Oh, I'm not cutting anything out. It's a chill cast. <laughs> Oh, the Gulf Stream. We're getting, Mark's got all the facts. The Gulf Stream brings warm air to Spain even during the winter. Nice. Yeah, that makes sense. We need Spain the Gulf is Stream. not known as being cold. No. It's known as being quite warm. Very mild, at least. But they're barely south of us. Not nearly as chill. Yeah, and I guess the island effect for, for England and, and Ireland and all them. Anyways, <laughs> the sunset, I mean, like the sunset effect is is worse than us, though. Slightly. Yeah, how much would that affect? Okay, so we're 42 degrees north. London's 50. Just look up How much does that affect? So London, London sunset, sunset, December 21st. December 21st. Is it like before four? Yeah, 355. So that's 20 minutes. Okay, so it's not... It's it's pretty bad. (laughs) It is pretty bad. (laughs) All right, well, uh, what game were we talking about? Dinosauria, but then that... Went way off the rails. I don't know how we got here. <laughs> Dinosaur, it's kind of like Splendor. Yeah. Okay. I didn't play it, but I like Splendor. Kind of like Splendor. Read the review. It's a little flatter than spend Splendor in terms of like the momentum curve. But because the thing is, in Splendor, you get passive income. In Dinosaur, you have to like tap cards for your passive income, but it's actually not passive because it's an action, which kind of flattens things out a bit. Uh, so you do get a little bit more efficient towards the end of the game, but not like Splendor where you're really ramping up. Um, which in some ways makes it better, in some ways it makes it worse. Yeah. I don't know. I, uh, I had a couple days of fun with it. I made a spreadsheet because the AI was making me mad. Turns out I was just rolling very unluckily. Oh, this is the one where you were testing the mathematics of the game. I thought we had, I mm-hmm. was convinced we had another outpost Siberia situation. Mm-hmm. Speaking of chill. Wow, Mark. <laughs> It was not a chill game, despite its chill theme. <laughs> yeah, but Siberia, cold. Like, they're synonymous. Uh, for those who remember Outpost Siberia being the co-op game that was, at most player counts, mathematically impossible to win. Mm-hmm. Uh, but even at six player, which was the easiest, absurdly difficult to win. Like, you had mm-hmm. to just be almost perfectly lucky. Uh, we never came close. I thought we had another one of those situations. Turns out... The AI, what the AI system basically just gives itself points each round based on a die roll, and it's very variable. And so, if you average out like the expected points, which I did, and that was all the math I was doing, uh, it's it's a pretty reasonable challenge. But like if you roll, especially on medium difficulty, which is what I was trying, if you roll a higher than expected number of sevens, you're just gonna lose. Like it, it quickly becomes a situation where it is impossible to win, which is what happened to me because I rolled like five sevens in a row. Anyways, that's Dinosauria. What's our last game? Bat Flip. Oh, yeah, the one we literally just yes, played. We just played. Uh, this game is called Bat Flip. It is, I believe, only available from print on demand Game Crafter. It was a lot of fun, very thematic. I don't even play very, or don't even watch very much baseball. I definitely don't play it. But the game made sense, and it was fun. Yeah. Uh, I was looking up who made it. It's a guy named Scott Corlander, and the publishing company is named Scorlander, which is clever. <laughs> I like that. That's great. If I ever make a publishing company, there's not really a good pun I can do with a Davis. Ask Lindsay. She'll come up with something. That's true. We mm-hmm. have some very good mm-hmm. punsters in our group. Uh, but yeah, Pat, Pat Flip, I didn't hear anything you said about it. But uh, I will say that I that it was a pretty good first impression. I think it's it kind of captures baseballness with it. It's a two-player baseball game. Uh, it's kind of a hand management is the system for sure, which definitely feels sort of like baseball management in that you're trying to squeeze value out of each and every player 
as much as possible. You're trying to hold on to certain players for certain situations. You're trying to, you know, get cycle through the players you, you you need to cycle through. So in that sense, kind of feels like baseball management a little bit, at least in the National League where they have real baseball and not the American League where they have the designated hitter. Mark. Mark. Although All of I'm this pretty context. sure National League is picking up the designated hitter, or at least it's rumored to, and that's a tragedy. All of this context completely lost on me as a player. Completely. Okay, Amber, here's what you need to know. You're the one who does all these baseball simulation things. You know everything there is to know about it. Here's what you need to know. I don't even think I need to know it. No, I just, I'm just i just going to tell you. <laughs> one of the leagues, the National League, has like 80% more strategy to it. What? Yeah. Here's how it works. So, like, you have pitchers, right? They're specialists. Yes, you have pitchers. Well, I, I know you know this, but I'm making sure there may be, you know, nerds historically, stereotypically, not necessarily into into sports as much. Who don't know about pitchers. Maybe. We got we have international <laughs> uh we have international listeners. Okay. okay. They may not be in as much to baseball. I don't think Europe's into baseball as much. Asia is, South America is, but Europe's more concerned with soccer, whatever. So you have pitchers, and they're specialists. Mm -hmm. So they're typically pretty much, I mean, like the best pitcher at hitting would still not be a major league hitter. Like if he was a hitter. Sure. Like his level is not even to like bad major league hitting. Sure. So you're looking at like uh, Adam Wainwright's pretty good. Um, Who's the Giants guy? Bum Gardner is probably, I believe, considered to be like the best hitter, uh, at least a couple of years ago. And maybe if he went full time hitting and practice a lot, he would be a good hitter. Uh, so there's situations where that has happened uh, with the Cardinals, my team, most notably with Rick and Keel. <laughs> uh, he got the pitching yips, turned into a, uh, a right fielder, uh, ended up being decent at hitting, but he was like an all, he was a gold glove level right outfielder. Uh, mostly because he had a cannon pitcher arm and threw people out all the time. Look up R- Rick and Keel, like throwing batters out stuff on YouTube. It's very good. Anyways, pitchers <laughs> are specialists. They don't hit well. So in the, in the National League, whoever's playing hits mm-hmm. like you would expect. Yep. There's nine players on the field. Those nine people have to hit. Mm-hmm. In the American League, you have what's called the designated hitter. Mm-hmm. So that means they have a special person whose only job is to hit in place of the pitcher. Mm-hmm. So the pitcher never hits. Mm-hmm. That just kills so much strategy about the game, right? Because in the National League, you may get to a situation where maybe the pitcher could go on, but maybe they're getting kind of tired. But you get to a situation now where there's people on base and the pitcher's coming up to bat, and you're like, ooh, do we pull this pitcher? He's having a good game. And what you can do is put in what's called a pinch hitter, mm-hmm. which is, means that you substitute a batter from your bench for the pitcher. See, I thought that's what a designated hitter was. No, no, no. Designated hitter, Mm -hmm. their job, all they do is hit for the pitcher. Ah, I did not know this. And it's automatic. Whoever the pitcher is, they hit instead of the pitcher. A pinch hitter is what you do is you substitute a batter for the pitcher. Now the pitcher's out of the game because they've been substituted out of the game. That batter bats. And then before the next inning, you substitute a new pitcher in for that batter to do the pitching. And so now... What you've done is you've increased your chances of scoring runs during your at bat because you put in a better batter in, but you've also used up like two players. Mm-hmm. And then you get to what's called a double switch, which is where you basically do two substitutions at a certain point in the game so that the pitching slot, like the pitching batting slot, who's usually ninth in the order, last, will now, if you're on like, so say you're on number five batter, you do what's called a double switch, and basically you manipulate it with two different swaps so that the pitcher's spot is now the number four batter. And so you manipulate it so the pitcher slot comes up less often, uh, which is a really cool part of the game. But it's it's just like a board game. Like you're sacrificing, you're gaining like short-term tempo, but you're sacrificing flexibility because you're using up players who are on your bench. Okay. Well, this sounds like All the kinds of fun game. stuff. Yeah. yeah, and that's what this game sounds like. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I I don't remember if it's, if it's official that it's going to happen, but I'm pretty sure the National League is going to lose the 
uh, is going to lose their n- normal baseball status and soon uh, actually adopt the designated hitter. And that will be a sad day for America. Why isn't it going the other way? Because the designated hitter speeds up games by like five to ten minutes. And baseball is all about speeding up the game. Huh. That's weird. Big complaint is that baseball takes too long. And that's why people aren't as interested in it anymore. So they're doing all kinds of things that make the games go by faster. I don't think that's the problem. I think the problem is it's kind of boring anyways. <laughs> I kind of agree, right? Like there's a certain, like there's people like me who will always enjoy a baseball game. Going to a baseball game as an event is great. And I don't care how long it takes if I'm going to it as an event. But watching on TV is boring, so it does not matter how fast it goes. Watching baseball on TV is when I get my best writing done. (laughs) (laughs) It's like the perfect thing to idly watch. It's wonderful. Anyways, bat flip. It's a baseball game. It's about hand management. You're tr- you're you're doing. You play over three innings for a game, which took what twenty to thirty minutes for our first game. So relatively quick, and it feels like that kind of in depth management. You're not doing precisely the kinds of decisions, but you're trying to manage what's in your hand and what you play to try to prevent runs or score runs or extend the inning. And it kind of captures some of that feel, some of that managerial feel which, mm-hmm. like during the game, which is really nice. I, I liked it quite a bit. The other bonus is that in the version I got, which I think is just the complete game, it comes with 11 different mini teams and each player t- gets two of them and shuffles them together. So it kind of like smash up. And each of these teams has a different emphasis and I look through them and they're very clear like what like they each have a different kind of strategic thing going on and, and it commits to it like so a lot mm-hmm. of these games a lot of games get kind of gun shy about having like committed strategies to different factions but this one really commits so you had one that was like the juicers and they were all about like big powerful attack or powerful offense yep uh, and the other one was, I don't remember the name the of it. The Pinchers. The mm-hmm. Pinchers. Lots of substitutions. Is, which is about substitutions. Mm-hmm. Again, pawning off a of pinch hitting or pinch running. You can have a pinch runner. You can substitute someone in once they're on base in baseball and have them run yeah, for all, the person. All my cards said that. I just didn't see why that well, I'm would talking about real baseball. be helpful. In real baseball, you can do that. Yeah. I guess if someone's injured, that's why you would do it. Well, if they're slow. Are they really that slow? Some players are really slow. Oh, okay. Often catchers and first basemen. Catchers just because their knees are destroyed. They have mm-hmm. the knees of like a 70-year-old. Uh, first basemen often, because the first basemen are often large, like power hitters, because mm-hmm. they don't have to be quite as mobile on the field. Um, so that's where people who are either just huge humans, like big and <laughs> slow people, or older guys who aren't as spry as they used to be who are in other positions will sometimes migrate over to first base hmm. uh, in the later part of their careers. Like Albert Pujols started as a left fielder and sometimes third baseman, uh, but they moved him over to first base pretty quick, and he would have eventually gotten there anyways. Again, it's Cardinals. Go Cardinals. Uh, so, yeah, a, a very strong first impression from me. I think it's really good. You know, sometimes when I take these... You know, these games that are only available through, like, Game Crafter, and it's clearly a first-time designer. I'm a little hesitant, but this one was baseball, and I love baseball. Mm-hmm. And I looked at the through, the through the rule book first, and it looked interesting, and it actually exceeded my expectations a bit. So I'll be excited to explore this one out. It did kind of remind me of Baseball Highlights 20-whatever, which I played once, and it kind of had... If I remember correctly, similar vibes, but Baseball Highlights was more about deck building. This one, you get your deck ahead of time, and I think Baseball Highlights had an, had a Yomi thing where you're playing cards simultaneously. This one, surprisingly, does not have a Yomi thing. You play cards in turn. So if you're on offense, you play your batter card first, and then the, the opponent gets to choose a defensive card. So your opponent can can literally choose whether or not to get you out. 
Well, the problem is if they do that a lot at first, they're just diluting their hand. Their hand yeah. starts to become very bad, and then you can score later on because their their hand of cards sucks. So that's the kind of fundamental decision space you're working with uh, with Bat Flip. I'm not. I gotta. I'm not sure if he's gonna publish. He might be doing a Kickstarter. Anyways, I'll do a review of it pretty soon and I'll have the details there about whether or not it's going up on Kickstarter or if he's going to start publishing or if it's just a, a game that's available on Game Crafter. Uh, I will say the uh, the art and the, the flavor of the game is pretty cool. It's kind of exaggerated, punny kind mm-hmm. of baseball characters in there uh, and it looks nice. It's a, it's a good production for uh, for this kind of, you know, small, super small publisher. Mm-hmm. Solid production for sure. And fun flavor text. The first card I pulled had some reference to Settlers of Catan. Yeah. Which was fun. Yeah. Lots of puns. If you like puns, the, it's got all the baseball puns in there. All right. We have chilled and we have casted. Yes, we have. How long was this one? We've been going for an hour, three minutes, and 33 seconds. Longer than I thought. I thought it'd be around 45 minutes. But well, I think your baseball rant helped. <laughs> well, in the map, the, all, all, the, all yes. the geography stuff. Which people can't see. The chillometer ratings. Mm-hmm. We managed to, to chill this one out and extend it. Just like ice, when freezing expands, we have taken this podcast and expanded it with time metaphors i'm on point i've never done this i don't know (laughs) what kind of mental state i'm on right now but uh the metaphors are flowing like cold stream water that one wasn't as effective no that one that one (laughs) i I guess that's a signal to end (laughs) what are you looking forward to playing amber i don't know i have i never ask you this and i should and that's a failure on my part i haven't really kept up with what is coming yeah I have I have a list here. Let's look. I got here's I I've, I've recorded. Look at this beautiful spreadsheet. <laughs> Nothing on your list looked particularly interesting. I've I got how many games? Thirty nine games that we have not played ever, mm-hmm. which is far too many. I always try to keep it like below five or ten. Mm-hmm. But uh oh wait no thirty eight. Hold on, change the status of Bat Flip since we just played it. Mm-hmm. To be fair, most of them are war games. I enjoy those. Yeah. yeah. We should do a Holland Spiel binge of various Holland Spiel games that I haven't pl- yet played or only played once. Are they good two player? Most of them play two player. 4X doesn't. Uh, but Blood and the Fog does. Guilty Land's only two player. What else do I got? Uh, I think. Nah, Infamous Traffic may be multiplayer. And I got some other ones. Okay. Maybe that's what we'll hop in next, and we could have a whole Hollenspiel podcast. Look at that. We're planning ahead. Are we? Or is this just you? <laughs> I guess if I write it down, it's planning. That's the distinguishing mark, right? Yes. I'm going to write this down. Okay. All right. Well, if you're still around, thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm like tired. I don't know. The only thing that's coming readily are the metaphors. But yeah, thanks for listening, everybody. If you haven't run away or aren't disgusted yet by our lack of preparation and commitment, uh, you can go to thethoughtfulgamer.com and we have more stuff. That was actually more prepared and planned than what you just listened to. Yeah, this is a chill cast. Yeah. But even then, I still feel a little guilty. No. Okay. Anyways, the thoughtfulgamer.com has stuff. If for some reason you want to help us in in doing this and doing the written reviews and, and all that, you can go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. Do you think people want to do that after this podcast? It's not the best one to announce that on. <laughs> I mean, I announce it on all of them, so it's not like I discriminate. Yeah, that's fine. You can leave it on. Probably won't get anyone signing up on this one, but that's okay. Ooh, but now we can now we can issue a Patreon challenge. The challenge is to <laughs> sign up on Patreon after this episode. In support of the chill cast. Right, that's how it works on like TikTok, right? They do challenges. That's what all the youths do. I think you should properly put it on TikTok then. Well, I don't I'm not gonna use TikTok. 
Well, then you can't do a TikTok challenge. Well, they do it on the other stuff, like the Instagram and Snapchat. Snapchat still around? Is that still a thing the kids do? Yeah. Okay, I don't have that. I do have Instagram. Anyways, this is a podcast exclusive challenge. Uh, support the podcast, patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer, and we will be appreciative. That's the challenge. <laughs> I mean, it's not different than normal, but Mark, I put the word challenge on it. Mark. It's time to end this podcast. <clears throat> what We're else a do, l- little loopy. What else do I say at the end of podcasts? Social media that that I'm on there. I think you can record the ending tomorrow if you need to. No, we'll do it live. I've never <laughs> recorded an ending. People have told me to. No, we're doing it live. Social media, Patreon, website. I did all those. Oh, you can rate and review podcasts at most places where podcasts are held. And if you do that, it helps the algorithms. And we all know if you don't feed the algorithms, they get very cranky. Thanks for listening, everybody. Good night. <laughs>